This is Viewpoints by Hennessy, a podcast featuring the latest thinking from the team at Hennessy Funds. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me for this episode are portfolio managers Bill Davis and Dave Ellison. Let's jump right in. Gentlemen, at the most recent Fed meeting, it appears that they gave no indication that rate cuts are coming. Dave, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on where the Fed is heading? Well, I think the Fed is heading where inflation's heading. I think that, you know, they've been really mindful of inflation for at least a couple of years now. And inflation has come down, at least that's what that's the numbers are saying. And so I think the Fed will follow that. I, I think they've been fairly easy to follow because they've given you a pretty good roadmap. People are just always thinking they're not going to follow the roadmap that they're telling you about. So uh, it looks like inflation is easing and the Fed will follow that path. Bill, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I largely uh, agree with Dave here. Um, you know, this particular Fed, it seems to be very data driven. And as Dave said, it sort of points to kind of everything that they're thinking and they're not too hard to, to decode. Um, if you look at the way in which the markets, or the futures markets are thinking about this, it would imply that, you know, sometime in Q2 to Q3 of 2024, the Fed's going to start a process of, of sort of actively lowering rates. And I would expect between now and then, they're certainly not going to raise rates, I wouldn't think. Um, I think one of the things that's worth following is uh, that there does seem to be increased margin pressure on major corporations. And if you just kind of think about that historically, I mean, it's kind of like a macro thing, but generally speaking, that will result in efforts to cut costs, which could result in increasing unemployment, which could hasten what the Fed is doing. But I think they're just going to look at all this data and then figure it out from there. If I could add to that, Jay, I think I think my, you know, I my comment would be that I think inflation has been more meaningful to the economy than rates have been um, in terms of either slowing the economy or helping corporations maintain margins uh, that we so far. So I think people are focused on rates, but the reality is, is I think that the move in inflation, especially the last couple of years, maybe not so much the last six months, has been pretty meaningful. And I think that's uh, something that is underappreciated by the market. Next question. So Ford recently announced that they're scaling back some of their plans for a $3.5 billion battery plant as demand has started to wane a little. Bill. Where do you see demand heading in the EV market for the next one, three, five years? Well, demand is still going up. I mean, I think this is where headlines get us in trouble sometimes. I think, um, you know, if you zoom out and let's start kind of with a five-year point of view, or I guess a seven, six, seven-year point of view, by 2030, um, EV is going to account for a minimum of two-thirds of all new car sales globally. In China, it's going to be 90% of new car sales. And I think what we're seeing right now outside of the U.S., so I think the U.S. is kind of a bit of a different case, but outside the U.S., uh, it's now cheaper to own an EV than it is an uh, internal combustion uh, vehicle. And so um, I think the problem in the U.S. is a little bit unique. So some of these other markets like China started off with products that were accessible to the masses. In the U.S., we started off essentially with luxury EV, which attracted the people that could afford that. We're now trying to move into mass market EV sales and we're bumping up against a couple of important things. One is high interest rates. Um, the second is relatively uh, inexpensive gasoline, so competing you know, fuel. Uh, and I think the third is that it's not all that inexpensive in the US, nor is it, you know, frankly, very accessible to find charging operations for people who aren't simply charging at their homes. So all of those things are headwinds in the U.S. and that's affecting Ford. But but the there is no doubt that the industry is is going to continue to grow and it is you know very quickly going to dominate all car sales. Dave, do you have any thoughts based on your work? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's a matter of having patience. I think the, you know, the, the politicians or the people that are 
you know, fear mongering about the about the climate and so on and so forth, want it to happen very quickly. And it just doesn't doesn't work that way, especially when you when a, this mode of transportation is very important for a lot of people, whether it's getting to work or getting to see family or whatever. So I think the reliability is there. It's just the infrastructure, as Bill said, is not built out yet. And it's going to take, you know, another 10 years. But I agree. Eventually, you know, most car sales will be electric and that's a new industry. It's a, it's like going from a, a phone at home to a phone in your pocket. It just it takes a while. All right. Our next topic is insider selling. So Jeff Bezos and Jamie Dimon have recently made news after it's reported they unloaded a significant number of shares of their own companies. Dave, how important is it to watch this as a portfolio manager? Well, I think it's, you know, it's like TMZ. You sort of watch it. It's interesting to watch. I, I don't think it really <laughs> determines where the stock is going. Um, a lot, you know, a lot of these guys have been selling stock for many years and it wasn't a reason. So I, I've never gotten rich, you know, shorting a stock that an insider is selling or gotten rich, you know, buying a stock that, that an insider is buying. So it's just one of the many things that happens in, in the, the pace of, of following companies and, and watching, you know, them grow or shrink or get into trouble or get better. So I don't think it's a meaningful metric, uh, it's really sort of cotton candy in the in, in the dietary sort of stream. <laughs> Bill, what are your thoughts on insider selling? Yeah, I'm with Dave here. I mean, I think that especially selling, right? Like insiders sell for all kinds of reasons. And it's important. You mentioned Bezos. Um, you know, he sold what I think amounts to about one and a half percent of his Amazon holdings. He still, by the way, has 988 million shares of Amazon uh, after this. And so you know, he's he's selling to to buy a half a billion dollar boat and he's selling to, you know, fund his um, uh, space exploration company and whatever. And so I think, you know, people sell for lots of reasons. People tend to buy for this, the reason that they think the stock is going up. But sometimes people get that wrong. The only thing that we find interesting is when you have clusters, uh, when you have cluster behavior and you can compare it within a company and you can look at it over time. I mean, I think it's kind of meaningful, but it's not like, you know, as Dave said, it's very difficult to get rich, you know, playing that particular trade. Next topic is inflation. So I recently heard a new term, funflation, and this is the name given to that dramatic inflationary pressures we're seeing in entertainment from Taylor Swift tickets to a reported 25% increase in sporting event tickets. Inflation's really hitting everywhere. Bill, how does inflation factor into your portfolio construction process? So it's there. It's not a major piece of it. What I would say is that it shows up in things like interest coverage and growth forecasts. Uh, but we have never found inflation to be predictive of whether a company is going to underperform or inflation in and of itself as to whether a company is going to underperform um, or outperform. I do think that... Um, one interesting thing, and like we, Dave, you sort of touched on this earlier, but clearly the inflation numbers are getting better, which is to say inflation is growing a lot less quickly than it was before. It's not like it's actually going down. It's just kind of getting to kind of a more normal pattern. Um, and I think, you know, since obviously Q1 of 2020, to me, that's a really interesting time frame because um, there's been so much inflation since then. The question is, what has happened? as a result of, you know, like, what are we seeing today? And what, what I think what we're seeing is that two thirds of the run up has basically been taken off of the table. It's basically been recovered. And that suggests that a lot of this is sort of supply chain driven. Um, you know, however, inflation can have a huge effect on, you know, things like the housing market, which, which I hope we get a chance to talk about today, because I think that's, probably the biggest death star out there for the economy, as I see it at this point in the inflation cycle. Dave, I'd love your thoughts. And also, if you wouldn't mind adding some context on your thoughts around the validity of government reported CPI numbers as a, as a helpful tool in your portfolio construction process. Well, I think inflation in general, for me, I think I look at it and say, look, we really haven't had meaningful inflation for 20 or 30 years. And so all of a sudden it goes up a little bit and now we know all about it. 
Um, you know, we're supposed to be, be intelligent about it. We, you know, we didn't know when it was going to go up. We didn't know when it was going to stop going down. And so I, I think you have to sort of see what the companies are doing. And I always say, you know, watch what people do, not what they say. And the companies are adjusting. They're moving prices. They're moving labor. They're, you know, so I think the the thing that I see is that companies are much better run than they were 40 years ago when I started. They have better information. They have better decision making. Not all of them, but but enough of them that it makes a difference in the economy. And I think they'll work themselves through it just like they worked through low inflation, which had its challenges as well. So, but when it comes to the government reporting, you know, I think you take it for what it is. They're they're doing the best they can to try to give you a a, a valid, reasonable number. They're not trying to cheat or, you know, give you the wrong number or fake you out or anything. I just I just don't think it's you know, that, I just don't go for that kind of stuff. Everybody's trying to do the best they can. And it's obvious when people aren't. So I think we all sort of know that too. So so I, I sort of take it at what it is. It could be a little higher, a little lower. But again, I think if you look up from your computer and see what's happening out there in the world, that will tell you a lot. So people need to get off the TV and get off the computers and experience the world. And that will tell you more about what's going on with inflation than trying to read some number from the government. Well said, Dave. Our next topic, home sales. So it's recently been reported that home sales have fallen to a 13-year low. Dave, how important is the housing market to the economy and the overall stock market? Well, I think there, you know, there are four big buckets of what people invest in. Uh, they invest in stocks, they invest in bonds, they invest in real estate, and they invest in money market funds. Everything else is sort of the, the stuff for all the really fancy people to play with. So so real estate, people's homes are an important part of their of their wealth metric. Um, and obviously, if you own a home, it's, you know, after a while, it doesn't matter what you paid for it as long as you can pay for the mortgage. So so I think real estate's important. Um, it obviously was very important in 2008. Home prices went down and that created a real problem on Wall Street and eventually it spread. So, uh, you know, we're in a, we're in an interesting time now in terms of supply demand for housing, I don't know where it's going to go, but uh, it just seems like there's a shortage of housing across the whole country and maybe even across the, the bulk of the developed world for a variety of reasons. And that's keeping prices up, which is you know going to, in a sense, help those people maintain their net worth and maintain their, their, their value. And therefore, it's going to help the economy. So, Bill, I'd love your thoughts and also some context around young homeowners today or young potential homeowners do we need to see a significant correction for them to be able to leg into this market yeah i mean i think that the current conditions are is basically like a death star for young homeowners i mean you've got as dave pointed out you've got um you've got high prices uh prices have not come down uh you've got high mortgage rates it's like around eight percent now i think uh and you've got low inventory and you couldn't really have a worse mix for people who are just trying to get onto that ladder of, of ownership and you know wealth appreciation, as Dave pointed out, because it's a it's a you know it's a huge piece of the typical household, whether it's an individual or a family's um, sort of wealth picture. And um, and I also think you know the other thing that's going on is that. Uh, it's a real disincentive right now to sell if you own, because if you're going to move, you're going to trade what a 3% mortgage. I think the average, um, you know, baked in mortgage for a homeowner in the U S is like between three and 4%. You're going to trade it in for something that's 8%. And in situations where people are in fact uh, downsizing or selling for whatever reason, there is such a frenzy over, um, you know, the lack of inventory that I think something like 29 or 30 percent of all houses are getting multiple bids and 15 percent of them are going for over ask. So uh, I actually don't know the solution to this. I mean, I think that certainly high interest rates or low, bringing the interest rates down and the mortgage rate down would certainly be helpful here. But as Dave pointed out, we also don't have enough supply. And that's not the kind of thing you can fix in a year or two. I mean, this is we're in a situation of what I would describe as perpetual demand. And I think that it's going to take time to unwind all of this and get adequate supply. 
Yeah, it is tough for the young folks who want to own homes today. I like your analogy to the Death Star. Our, our, our final topic, 2024 outlooks. Gentlemen, it's that time of year again where we like to look forward to next year. When you think about the S&P 500, do you think it will be up or down next year and why? Bill, let's start with you. All right. I think it's going to be down. And when I say the S&P, I'm referring to the S&P 500, which, as we know, is a market cap weighted index. Interestingly, if the question were what's the S&P equal weight going to be, uh, which tends to well, it, it involves many more of the lower cap companies. Uh, I think that's actually going to be up. So I think what I'm really saying is that I think that the mega cap trade has sort of hit a high point for a while. And I don't see that continuing. At least I think it's going to always continue to be a factor, but I don't think that's going to be what's going to be driving the market in 2024. And just a real quick example of that, you know, NVIDIA came out with earnings last week. Um, their their sales were 206 percent uh above a year ago and 36 percent above a quarter ago their profits were 12x what they were a year ago uh i don't know 50 roughly 50 percent higher than a quarter ago um one might think that that would be like positive on their stock price the stock price went down why because basically it's priced all of that perfection that they've been delivering is priced in. And I think that it's far more likely that one of these companies could stub their toe from a regulatory standpoint or, you know, headwinds from global markets standpoint or whatever. And then all of a sudden you've got a lot more downside than up. Yep. Yep. Dave, what's your take? Well, I, I, I think to keep it really simple, the, the market has been uh, flat to down or you know, not done much the last couple of years because rates have gone up and the curve is inverted and people are, are worried about what rates will do to, to, to stocks. As Warren Buffett says, you know, interest rates are like gravity. You know, they, the higher they go, the more gravity there is against stock prices. And so I think that this year in, inflation is going to be less than, than it, you know, it's going to be lower. Rates may not go down, but they're not going to go up. And so now you're back to looking at companies without that cloak without that without that pressure of of uh, of interest rates and i think the market will generally be up the companies are going to adjust to, to what's happening they're going to adjust to the market adjust to labor costs and i think they'll do fine so i think it's you know rates flat to down the market's going to be up and i think that that's what rates are going to do i think and that's what the market's going to do keeping it really simple <laughs> Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Viewers, to learn more about Hennessy Funds, please visit HennessyFunds.com.